Some cities weren't just built, they were engineered masterpieces. From hidden geometry to flawless street grids, these places prove urban planning can feel like art. However, every insanely well-designed city has one thing in common. It puts people first. Streets, buildings, and public spaces are not just created for efficiency, but to improve everyday life. Few places capture this idea better than Copenhagen, Denmark. Often ranked among the most livable cities in the world, Copenhagen shows how design and planning can create a city that works for both its people and the planet. What makes Copenhagen different from many other cities is the way it was planned. Back in 1947, Danish planners Steen Eiler Rasmussen and Christian Erhard Bredsdorf introduced the Five Finger Plan. At the center sits Copenhagen's urban core, while train lines extend outward like the five fingers of a hand. Between these fingers are stretches of green space, ensuring that even as the city grew, nature was never pushed aside. This design allowed for an efficient transport system, easy access to green areas, and balanced urban expansion that avoided the overcrowding seen in other European capitals. Transportation is where Copenhagen truly shines. The city is famous worldwide for its cycling culture. Nearly 40% of residents commute daily by bike, and the number continues to grow. Dedicated bike lanes run through almost every street, making cycling safe, fast, and practical in all seasons. The network also includes bridges built only for cyclists and pedestrians, allowing people to bypass heavy car traffic altogether. Beyond bikes, the city offers buses, a metro system, and even water buses, ensuring that people can move around without relying heavily on cars. But Copenhagen is about creating spaces worth living in. City regulations ensure no home is more than 300 meters from a green area, whether it's a park, playground, or pocket garden. These small but intentional choices mean that families, children, and the elderly all have nearby spots to play, relax, or connect with nature. Walking streets in the city center, such as Stroget, encourage people to shop, stroll, and gather without the noise and danger of cars. Today, Copenhagen continues to expand with the same focus on sustainability and livability. Future projects emphasize renewable energy, climate adaptation, and even more bike-first planning. The result is a city that feels human. Copenhagen shows that great design is not about flashy buildings, but about creating a city where everyday life is easier, healthier, and more enjoyable. Singapore Even though Copenhagen shows how thoughtful planning and cycling culture can make a city more livable, Singapore demonstrates a different path. Built on limited land with almost no natural resources, Singapore had to innovate from the ground up. Instead of spreading outward, the city grew upward, introducing vertical gardens, cutting-edge infrastructure, and a governance model that keeps corruption low and efficiency high. Where Copenhagen is about openness and balance, Singapore is about precision and reinvention. When Singapore became independent in 1965, it had few natural resources, limited land, and a growing population to house. Much of the island was made up of swamps and wetland, hardly an ideal foundation for a global metropolis. Yet within a few decades, Singapore transformed itself into one of the world's cleanest, greenest, and most efficient-run cities. Its rise is not just about tall buildings and modern transport systems, but about how nature, technology, and governance were built together. One of the most iconic features of Singapore is its embrace of vertical gardens and greenery. The city's famous super tree grove at Gardens by the Bay is a symbol of this idea, but the philosophy extends far beyond tourist attractions. High-rise buildings are designed with green rooftops, hanging gardens, and vertical plant walls that reduce heat, improve air quality, and give residents a sense of nature even in the middle of the city. The government's city in a garden vision has resulted in almost half of Singapore being covered in green space, despite its limited land size. Equally impressive is the city's infrastructure and approach to waste management. Instead of letting rubbish pile up, Singapore treats it as a resource. A significant portion of waste is incinerated, and the ash is used to help build Pulau Semakau, an offshore island landfill that doubles as a nature reserve. Visitors are often surprised that a landfill site can also be a place for birdwatching, fishing, and scenic walks, but that's exactly the kind of design ingenuity Singapore has mastered, solving urban problems while adding value to daily life. Another key ingredient is governance. Singapore is consistently ranked among the least corrupt countries in the world. Low corruption ensures that public funds are directed into projects that benefit citizens directly, efficient public transport, reliable utilities, and well-maintained public spaces. This focus on clean governance reinforces the city's ability to plan long-term, without the setbacks that plague many other urban centers. Singapore proves that with the right vision, even the most unlikely location can be turned into a model of modern urban design. It's not just a city built to function, but one built to inspire. Tokyo 
Where Singapore shows how limited land can be turned into a green and efficient city, Tokyo takes on a completely different challenge, scale. It's one of the most densely populated cities on Earth, yet instead of being chaotic, it runs with striking precision. Trains arrive on time, neighborhoods function around the clock, and millions of people move through the city each day without breaking its rhythm. Tokyo proves that even when a city grows to an enormous size, careful design and order can keep it both livable and efficient. The first thing many people notice about Tokyo is its rail system. The city has one of the most complex yet efficient networks in the world. Dozens of train lines, metro lines, and suburban rail systems overlap, but they run with precision. Trains are rarely late, and they connect almost every part of the city. This system allows millions of people to move daily without relying on cars. Stations themselves often function as city hubs, filled with shops, restaurants, and services, making them more than just transit points. Zoning in Tokyo works differently than in many western cities. Instead of separating areas strictly into commercial, residential, or industrial, Japan's zoning laws are more flexible. This means that small businesses, homes, and offices can often exist close together. As a result, neighborhoods remain active throughout the day and night, and people can find shops or restaurants within walking distance of their homes. This mixed-use planning also helps reduce long commutes, since many services are close by. Despite its size, Tokyo is also known for being orderly and safe. Streets are clean and crime levels are low compared to other large cities. The density is managed through compact living spaces and efficient use of land. While apartments may be small, the city makes up for it with accessible public spaces, well-organized streets, and a sense of shared responsibility in keeping the city functional. Tokyo also has an ability to adapt quickly. After natural disasters, rebuilding often leads to updated infrastructure and stronger regulations. The city constantly upgrades its systems, from earthquake-resistant buildings to digital ticketing on trains, ensuring it keeps up with both safety needs and modern life. Amsterdam While Tokyo shows how order can manage one of the largest populations in the world, Amsterdam takes the opposite approach with slower streets, human-scale design, and a focus on walking and cycling. Both cities prove that there isn't one single formula for good planning. And then there's Singapore, which had to invent its own model altogether, transforming from swampland into a vertical green and highly efficient city built almost entirely from scratch. Amsterdam's design roots back to the 17th century when the city expanded along four concentric canal rings. These canals gave the city a clear structure and continue to guide its layout today. Houses were built in clusters along the waterways, supporting each other on the soft ground, and their tall, narrow facades soon became the city's most recognizable image. Unlike cities that grow outward in sprawling patterns, Amsterdam developed in a compact, connected form, which has made it naturally suited for walking and cycling. Public housing and neighborhood design have always played an important role in Amsterdam's planning. The Dutch focus on facades, scale, and alignment gives the city a unified appearance where even everyday homes contribute to the urban character. This attention to detail ensures that streets feel cohesive and welcoming. Public housing projects in particular were designed not just to provide shelter, but to reflect dignity and create spaces where people could live as part of a strong community. One of Amsterdam's greatest achievements is its pedestrian-first environment. Narrow streets, limited space for cars, and extensive cycling lanes make the city easy to navigate without vehicles. More than half of trips within the city are made on foot or by bike, and public transport with trams, buses, and ferries fills in the rest. This design reduces pollution and traffic while making streets safer for children, families, and the elderly. In Amsterdam, streets are not only for moving through, they are places to meet, shop, and spend time. The city also invests heavily in public spaces and greenery. From small squares and playgrounds to tree-lined canals and parks, open space is built into the urban fabric. Dutch planning emphasizes that every resident should have access to public areas within a short walk. This approach strengthens community ties and keeps the city lively at all hours. Vancouver Unlike every other city, Vancouver in Canada tells a different story. Vancouver had natural beauty from the start, with the presence of mountains, water, and forests, but what makes it special is how the city chose to grow within this setting. Instead of expanding endlessly outward or crowding people into towers without thought, Vancouver developed its own model of urban design, now known around the world as Vancouverism. Vancouverism is an approach that combines high-density living with livability. Tall, slim towers are built close together, but always with open views toward the mountains and the water. These towers almost always stand on podiums, lower buildings at street level, that contain shops, services, and community spaces. The idea is simple. People live above, while life happens below. This design keeps the city dense enough to house many residents, while also making sure the ground level feels active, safe, and welcoming. 
Mixed-use urbanism is at the center of this model. Instead of separating residential, commercial, and cultural areas, Vancouver blends them. A person can live in an apartment, shop for groceries downstairs, and walk a few minutes to a park or transit stop. This reduces the need for long commutes and creates neighborhoods that feel complete on their own. Streets are designed to prioritize pedestrians and cyclists, with cars taking a secondary role. The result is that residents can meet most of their daily needs within walking distance, which makes the city both practical and sustainable. Public space is another key element. Vancouver has carefully planned waterfront walkways, bike paths, and urban paths that connect neighborhoods to nature. The famous seawall around False Creek and Stanley Park is one example. It allows people to walk or cycle along the water without interruption, linking dense neighborhoods directly to green and blue spaces. This balance between density and nature is what makes Vancouver stand out compared to other North American cities, where growth often means sprawl and traffic. Meanwhile, Vancouver's model has become so influential that Vancouverism is now studied by planners worldwide. It shows that cities can grow upward while still remaining livable, green, and connected to community life. By blending density with accessibility and natural beauty, Vancouver has created a unique identity that continues to inspire urban design around the globe. Seoul, Where Vancouver shows how density can be balanced with nature through tall towers and walkable streets, Seoul in South Korea highlights another path, using technology and bold redesign projects to guide the future of the city. Seoul is one of the largest metropolitan areas in the world, home to more than 25 million people in the greater region, and yet it is managed with systems that combine digital tools, strong infrastructure, and carefully restored public spaces. One of the most important projects in Seoul's modern planning is the Cheonggyeoncheon Stream Restoration. For decades, this natural stream was buried under layers of concrete and an elevated highway as the city industrialized. By the early 2000s, it had become a forgotten space. The government made the choice to tear down the highway and bring the stream back. Today, the Cheonggyeoncheon runs for about 10 kilometers through central Seoul, offering walking paths, green banks, and clean flowing water in the middle of dense neighborhoods. What was once a traffic corridor is now a public park that cools the city, reduces air pollution, and provides residents with a daily escape from the noise of urban life. Seoul is also a global leader in smart city planning. Digital systems are built into the city to improve how people move and how services are delivered. Traffic lights are adjusted using real-time data to reduce congestion. Public transport is tracked digitally so passengers know exactly when buses and trains will arrive. Smart energy grids monitor use across districts to reduce waste, while air quality sensors allow the city to respond quickly to pollution levels. These are not abstract systems, they directly shape how people experience the city every day. Technology in Seoul is not limited to transport or energy. Public Wi-Fi is available almost everywhere, and mobile apps connect residents to city services instantly. From booking medical appointments to reporting repairs in neighborhoods, these tools allow the government to respond faster and citizens to stay more engaged. What makes Seoul different is that it has combined this technological focus with cultural and social investment. Alongside digital upgrades, the city continues to build plazas, markets, parks, and cultural spaces that reflect its traditions. But Seoul isn't the only city with well-designed social investments. Portland While Seoul shows how a city can use technology and large-scale projects to improve daily life, Portland in the United States demonstrates another important idea. The rules that shape land use can decide how people live, move, and connect. Instead of relying only on digital systems or dramatic rebuilding, Portland focused on zoning reform and walkability to build a city that is more sustainable and accessible. For much of the 20th century, many American cities followed zoning laws that separated where people lived, worked, and shopped. This led to car dependency and long commutes. Portland chose a different path. Beginning in the 1970s, the city adopted strong land use planning policies that limited sprawl and protected surrounding farmland and forests. Instead of expanding endlessly outward, growth was directed inward, within a clear urban growth boundary. This meant more compact neighborhoods, shorter travel distances, and a stronger sense of connection between communities. Zoning reform in Portland has continued to evolve. Recently, the city became one of the first in the U.S. to end exclusive single-family zoning across most neighborhoods. This change allows for duplexes, triplexes, and other small housing options to be built in areas that were once restricted to single houses only. The goal is to provide more housing choices, reduce prices, and make walkable neighborhoods available to more people. By rethinking its zoning rules, Portland is addressing both livability and affordability in a direct way. Walkability is another key part of Portland's design. Many of its neighborhoods were built around mixed-use principles where homes, shops, schools, and services are close together. 
Streets are designed with sidewalks, bike lanes, and public transit options that reduce the need for cars. The city has also invested in light rail, streetcars, and bus systems that connect neighborhoods to downtown. These choices make it possible for residents to move around without depending only on driving. Public spaces add to this network. Portland is known for its community parks, riverfront trails, and public squares that give people spaces to gather and enjoy the city at a human scale. The city's layout makes these areas accessible, tying together the goals of zoning reform with the daily experience of walkability. Barcelona. In Portland, the revolution happens one step at a time with walkable neighborhoods, smarter zoning, better flow. Barcelona, on the other hand, doesn't stop on the streets. It dares to redesign the city at the scale of entire blocks, turning ordinary grids into extraordinary experiments in urban life. Barcelona is not only known for its historic architecture and Mediterranean setting, but also for its bold experiments in modern urban planning, especially the concept of the superblock. Barcelona's city structure dates back to the 19th century grid plant designed by Ildefons Cerda. Wide streets, consistent block sizes, and a clear layout gave the city order and made expansion possible. But over time, traffic congestion and heavy car use began to dominate the city. To address this, Barcelona introduced the superblock model, known locally as Superies. A superblock is made up of nine city blocks grouped together, where through traffic is restricted, and streets inside the area are redesigned for pedestrians and cyclists. Cars can enter only at low speeds, mostly for local access. This model changes the way residents use their streets. Instead of being dominated by cars, superblocks turn into spaces for walking, biking, and community activities. Children can play outside more safely, small businesses benefit from increased foot traffic, and air quality improves. The city has already implemented superblocks in several districts, with plans to expand them further, reshaping the entire urban environment step by step. What makes Barcelona unique is how it manages to combine these new ideas with its historic fabric. The city is famous for its Gothic Quarter, its modernist architecture by Antoni Gaudi, and its centuries-old public squares. Rather than replacing these elements, the superblock strategy works around them, blending new planning methods into old neighborhoods. This creates a balance where Barcelona feels both historic and innovative at the same time. Public space has always been a central feature of life in Barcelona. Streets double as social areas, plazas host daily gatherings, and markets remain key community hubs. The superblock plan strengthens this tradition by giving even more space back to people rather than vehicles. Across the world, the most well-designed cities show that there is no single formula for creating great urban spaces. Studying these examples shows that great cities are not built by accident. They're carefully planned, constantly improved, and designed with both present and future residents in mind. While no city is perfect, the lessons from these places provide clear models for urban design that other cities can follow. In the end, what makes a city truly well-designed is not just its buildings or technology, but the way it supports the people who live, work, and move through it every day.